have you here today because there is a wonderful topic that we're talking about with imposter syndrome. Um, but before we get to that, I wanted to have my co-chair, Denise, let you guys know about our roundtable that's happening in April. So I'm going to turn it over to Denise, and then it'll come back to me, and we'll do our introductions with Aaron and Meg on imposter syndrome. Thanks, Katie. Um, next month is super exciting for me. Um, it is April 8th, and again, the typical 9 to 10, um, but we have some guests that are very interesting. Um, we're going to have Sean Dauber. Uh, he's from Horton, and he's going to briefly discuss uh, what benefits look like in our new COVID world. And he's going to give you suggestions on um, partial uh, employee engagement. What, you can, what can you give your employees to keep them engaged and happy? And then we have this amazing professional speaker. His name is Joe Mull. Joe is uh, going to talk about um, how to handle remote employee engagement. Um, sometimes you, you kind of see them as a little bit hokey, but other times you're like, hey, that's a great idea. So um, he's going to keep everybody engaged. Um, and Horton is kind enough to have donated two $50 um, Amazon cards. And we will also have Joe and he will be raffling off a couple of his books. So uh, we're looking for a heavy turnout and we want the, you know, we want to get everybody excited. So I look forward to having everybody out and tell your friends, this is going to be a good one. So the more the merrier. All right. Now it's time for Aaron Brown and Meg McKean to do their introductions and start talking about imposter syndrome. Thank you, Katie. Meg and I are thrilled to be here. This is a topic that's near and dear to our heart, and we're super passionate about talking with you, um, especially with HR professionals and the impact that you guys are having on your organizations every day. Um, so we'll just do brief introduction. Um, Meg, do you want to go, and then I can go after you? Yeah, um, just to echo the, the gratitude for the chance to be here and talk about this topic. It seems to be one that's popping up uh, more and more in print and in conversation, so timely, uh, we believe. So thanks again again for having us. I am Meg McKean. I'm the founder of Adjunct Advisors. I started uh, my consulting firm a couple years ago after 20 in the insurance industry, working as an underwriter in leadership and then as an agent myself. And really the core of the work I do is helping insurance salespeople to find and leverage what makes them great so that they can find success in insurance sales in a way that feels authentic to them and to the people that they want to help. So it's a coaching model, so one-on-one -on -one small groups facilitations. And what's been interesting about doing that work is it has led to work like this. So the much more softer, softer skills and things that in our industry we haven't always spent a lot of time developing. And it's in this work and in this chapter of my life that Aaron and I intersected, though we both have strong backgrounds in the insurance industry. So on a personal note, my roots are in Chicago. I'm currently in Maine, outside of Portland. I have very recently made the decision to simplify my life in a big way and travel for the next year. So I am currently in Maine and headed south where it's warm, I hope, because it is not warm here. So um, thank you again for the chance to be here, Erin. I'll kick it over to you. Thanks, Meg. As Meg mentioned, um, I come from the insurance industry as well. And I know Katie mentioned that kind of within this group, we have a number of people that are in that space as well. Um, so I spent about 12 years in the industry, always on account management side, team operations, and then team leadership as well, and leading um, client service teams um, at my prior company. That's really where I fell in love with the leadership development space and made a couple years ago, a career pivot to spoke focus on better supporting first time and middle managers. I do that through my company League Connects, which is a peer dream peer driven leadership community, specifically for first time and middle managers, where we connect them with HR professionals like you guys on this call, um, coaches, as well as each other, and then also offer virtual peer groups such as um, new leader peer groups for those individuals in the first time management roles, as well as one on one coaching as well. Um, so as Meg mentioned that imposter syndrome shows up obviously in her work and working with salespeople within the industry, imposter syndrome definitely shows up as it did for me personally, um, when you kind of make the transition into leadership roles and then throughout. So it's something we definitely um, intersect on um, 
despite kind of coming at the industry from different angles is definitely a common theme that we've seen. Yeah. I love it. And um, it's career paths, right? Fascinating to arrive in this moment, having this conversation. We're going to get sort of academic as we get started, and we're going to talk about imposter syndrome, understanding that we all come about this with a very different level of understanding. And if, if you don't mind, before we go there, we're just going to take a second. Um, the world is a heavy, loud, messy place right now. And it's a very interesting week in that for many of us, it's been one year since the shutdown, if you will, since a lot of our realities shifted in a really big way. And I don't know that anniversary is the right way to frame it, but it's significant, right? We've, we've accomplished a lot, we've overcome a lot, and we're still on our way. But one of the things Aaron and I like to do when we have this conversation is just level set for a second, give ourselves a minute to focus. This is, this is a different part of our brain and our energy that we're going to channel um, in our time together. So with that, if you don't mind, um, this is a, a personal exercise for you. Think back to the last year, any, any point in time when you truly felt joy. And share if you feel compelled in the chat. Don't if you don't, but think about the word joy and what that means to you. And we'll come back together in just a couple seconds. Perfect, thank you. Um, I think it's important. We think it's important to honor our whole selves as we show up in our work. So I'm glad that we had a chance to go through that um, together. And with that, oh, I love it. Drew, thanks for chiming in in the chat. And just a reminder, the chat is for all of us. It's a great way to stay connected and communicate during this session. Aaron and I will be reading it and monitoring. I know Katie's on, on hand to do that as well. So questions, feedback, comments, aha moments that you have, throw them in there. We love to hear from you. This will be exceptionally interactive. It, all is, it also is exceptionally personal. So um, feel free just to sit back and observe if that feels like the right energy use for you today. Um, so Drew shared being home for my son's first and now second birthday and seeing him develop and being here for that. I love the emphasis on here. Really great. I got to meet my great niece at two months in November, cooking dinner with my children, watching them play sports. Um, Easter, not seen for six weeks. Yep. We are making it work, friends. <laughs> we are making it work. Um, I love that. Feel free to keep sharing those stories in the chat. Um, we will move on. Imposter syndrome, perhaps you have a firm understanding, perhaps you've already recognized it in yourself, or maybe this is the very first time that you've heard the term and you're here with a, a sense of curiosity. Wherever you are, thank you uh, for being here. Imposter syndrome can take lots of different shapes and forms, which we're going to get into in a little bit. But fundamentally, as you'll see in this, uh, this cartoon here, it's this idea that even though you've achieved a level of success, you aren't really worthy of it, that you haven't deserved it, that maybe it was luck, maybe it was timing, being in the right place at the right time, or that feeling that it's just a matter of time before someone figures out that you have no idea what you're doing and that the whole thing is a sham and you are a total fraud. And it's a term that's been around since 1978. It's not new but it's starting to gain a lot more traction in our day-to-day -day as we become more and more comfortable saying the words out loud that we feel this way. And as we approach our work with more of a head and a heart connection. Um, and with that, Erin, I'll kick it over to you to talk about some of the ways imposter syndrome shows up in the world. Yep, one thing we wanted to highlight, we like to highlight right out of the gate is it's incredibly common. In fact, 70% of people experience the feelings associated with imposter syndrome that Meg just talked about, including very, very successful people like the ones you have on your screen. Um, and so many people who've achieved really high levels of success openly talk about their experiences. And I wanted to share one quick quote from Tom Hanks, who I know when we've had given this presentation in the past, people are always like, really, Tom Hanks has imposter syndrome? Yes, he does. And he shared that no matter what we've done, there comes a point where you think, how did I get here? When are they gonna discover that I am back a fraud and take everything away from me? And what's really fascinating um, about imposter syndrome is actually it tends to rear itself in the most driven successful people. Those kind of doubt, self-doubts that come up is not at all um, indicative, right, of a lack of potential or a lack of success um, that they've achieved in their career. 
And also it's for whatever reason, and it's success and self-doubt often go hand in hand, you know, and with imposter syndrome. And as we said, 70% of people. And one thing we like to highlight is it's not necessarily a lack of confidence. Sometimes people say imposter syndrome equals a lack of confidence. That's really not the case. It's really an inability to truly assess your own what you've achieved, your own skill sets, what you're bringing to the table, you're really underestimating it. And oftentimes intellectually, right, you know you're bringing a lot to the table, but it's still those feelings that creep up in the moment. And that's kind of, we're more talking about, as Meg said, the head and the heart. A lot of this is a little more driven by the heart, you know, and like we're kind of trying to correct it a little bit with the head. Um, given that we are in the HR space today, we did want to provide some context within organizations as well. There have been different articles, as Meg said, that there's imposter syndrome been being talked about frequently right now, and there's a lot more greater awareness around the topic. A couple of things we want to highlight. Having this conversation and talking about imposter syndrome is not meant to be about fixing, right, an individual. There's nothing wrong with the individual. These are incredibly common feelings and thoughts that people are having. It's really about bringing that awareness and kind of learning how to navigate through that. There's also a variety of factors that impact imposter syndrome. You see we have people of both genders, multiple races on the screen. Um, it shows up in all people. However, with that said, there are um, systemic issues, um, cultural issues that can cause it to be more prevalent in certain groups of people, like women, like minorities. Um, and we just want to make sure that that um, imposter syndrome doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? And we think that's really important for everyone to understand, especially in the HR space as you're navigating um, the cultures within your organization and how you can support your employees, is there going to be reasons and situations that cause it to potentially be exasperated in certain groups of people. Meg, anything you wanted to add on that? I, I'm, even though we've, we've talked about this many, many times, I'm still, it's, it's such a soft reminder of the prevalence, but also the safety in talking about it when you see these faces on the screen, that these are people that make it look easy and to know from them that it's not, um, makes me feel a whole lot more welcome in the conversation and I know others too. So nope, just validation for everything that you shared. It's, it's timely and relevant. Um, just a quick reminder before we keep going, this is the, this is the section of the presentation where Aaron and I get to pop the hood on our own experience with imposter syndrome. And so as we're telling our stories, you are more than welcome to share your own. I know you're all muted. We have a fairly small group this morning. So if you feel compelled to share, we'll offer at the end of our little, our share um, for you to unmute yourself and chime in. You're also welcome to use the chat if you feel compelled. So just a reminder there. And Erin, I'm gonna ask you to kick us off with some of our, our personal reflections of imposter syndrome in the workplace. So as I mentioned um, at the beginning when I, in my introduction is um, I spent some time, five years at my last company in team leadership roles. And I've noticed for myself, particularly imposter syndrome will really show up in those times of transition, but also tied to kind of the leadership, right? Position, quote, of quote, of authority and kind of decision making. And I distinctly remember um, when I, my prior manager may ask me to take the lead, become the team leader of the largest team at the company. I'd only been in a team leader, a leadership role about eight months. They had also fired, quote unquote, the last four in the past five years. And I remember sitting there being like, oh no, they are going to totally find out I am not equipped for this role. But I decided, you know, kind of what we'll talk about, you know, later on is, you know what, just go for it, take that chance, don't listen to those kind of inner doubts, they see something in you. But I still remember that first time I had to do the team kickoff meeting. Um, and there's like 50 people in the room, it's the president of the company, the sa sales people, the customer success, and kind of walking in and I'm like, this is when they're gonna find out that they made the wrong decision, that I they was not the one to take the chance on. They should have brought in someone with 10 years of experience. Um, and despite, I think it's very, we see it very naturally, right, when you're in those times of transition, right? And that on some level to be expected. But even four years later, those doubts, especially in kind of those annual kickoff meetings or those difficult conversations that you have to have with people, 
is that thought, they just still come up, you know, and I think what's really important with having this conversation with HR people, especially as you're working with new leaders and leaders in the organization, they're probably more likely to have these thoughts than other people, right? Because we talked about the success side of it, you know, and really kind of opening that door, which we'll talk about, um, so you can have that conversation with them too. But that's kind of my story tied to um, kind of my corporate experience and team leadership. And Meg, how about you? Yeah, I... I, that resonates so closely with me and and I have lots, Aaron and I have lots, but the one I'll choose to tell this morning is about a brief turn that I had as a, an underwriting manager on the carrier side of the insurance business. So the provider side, and I was managing a team of employees that was somewhere in the office and some were remote and they had different job functions. And so Together, we were a team, but we were very disjointed in terms of how we approached the business, how we were measured, how in all of the ways. And so I had an opportunity to bring the team together physically in the same space. And it was to do some sort of very traditional corporate meeting type. And I thought, you know, we have an opportunity here to really use this time to build connection and build team and, and energy and so I created an exercise and it was, it was a game. It was meant to be slightly competitive, but also pair people together with people they might not typically work with. And, um, and we worked through different stages of the game together. And, and I was standing in front of the room implementing. And I looked at my boss who's sitting there at the conference room table and she's got her arms crossed and she's kind of leaning back and she's got this look on her face like, has Meg lost her mind? And all of a sudden, all the energy just dropped from my body. And I was like, what have I done? This was a terrible idea. I should have just stepped, I should have stuck with the agenda, right? I was there to have this meeting and I went the other direction. And then I continued because I'm a professional and that's what we do in these moments. And after the fact, she pulled me aside and she said, that was the right call. Now her body language didn't, didn't show me that, but when it was all said and done, I was standing up there feeling like I had just committed the biggest offense in my professional career and ended up being praised for it. But in that moment, wow, did I feel like I had no business making that judgment call um, for my team. And a whole other webinar about feelings and doubts and how things work out and all that. But, um, but imposter syndrome, thinking back, has probably been with me for most of my life in different ways. So um, feel free, this is your time. Um, we're here to, to keep the conversation moving and share some insights with you. But if you feel compelled to share, please do. Um, personal and professional, it's, it's a thing. Erin, any thoughts as we give people a second to, to chime in? I just echo what you said, it, you know, like you said, it's been with you most of your life. I know it's definitely something that's been with me most of my life as well. And I think that's very common, right? And people, because how we're um, raised, um, like the expectations in our families and churches and culturally, all these things can kind of, they just, right? People don't show up at work is like half their self, right? They're bringing like their entire lives, you know, and experiences they've had to that date as part of kind of how they're showing up um, at work. And I think that's just such an important thing to remember because most, yeah, imposter syndrome is not just an adult thing, right? It's definitely something, as we talk about it, you can see in your children, your friends, nieces, nephews, et cetera. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've important. seen it in the last year, just with myself, with being home and trying to work a job and teach the kids e-learning. And I felt like I was feeling at all fronts, like, are you a parent, a good parent? Are you taking care of your kids? And it's like that self-reflection of my kids have a house they're living under. I'm able to feed them food and they have clothing. So they're doing great and I'm doing great. So it's like, we have these high expectations of perfection and humans aren't supposed to have that characteristic. And so I do affirmations on my mirror. It sometimes is a wake up call to me because I'm so critical on myself where I'm second guessing my decisions at home. Mm -hmm. um, and I also see it in the workplace. I recently got promoted and I'm in a role that I am not the subject matter expert, which is a little scary, um, but I know how to lead people. And that's why I'm in this role. So I, again, have to do that self-talk and I have experts that on my team that can do it. Thank you for sharing Katie. And you bring up a great point, which are some of the tools that we're going to dig into a little bit later because we don't want to drop <laughs> 
drop the problem and not drop the solution as well. So we'll give you some things to think about. And you also bring up a really interesting point. We may not feel it. You may, this may not be landing with you and you may be operating from a place of total self-confidence 100% of the time. And that is super. But if 70% of the population is feeling this to some degree at some point, there are absolutely people around you who are feeling it. So perhaps you can use your tools and your skills and the knowledge and awareness that you have to help others on their journey, which is also a really powerful position um, to be in as a mentor and as a coach. So um, Drew, thank you for chiming in. Um, Debbie, great comments in the chat. Constantly doubting being a first time mom doesn't help boost the confidence. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. And just to kind of, I guess, reiterate for lack of better word, kind of like what we're talking about is just take a second here and read these two cartoons. And we'd love to hear from you in the chat if one or both resonate with you. So just throw in if the one on the left or one on the right chime, um, which one resonates with you most. Karen, which one are you feeling today? I mean, I feel like I usually always fall in like the right one is the one that always resonates the most with me. Uh, I could definitely see the left one, but the right one for sure. How about you? Um, it's the right today. It's the right, definitely the right. It's, it doesn't matter how many times I, I'm encouraged on my path. It's the one naysayer that, that just has me question the whole works. Um, and it sounds like people are saying the same thing. It's more right, more often. Sometimes it's left. It depends on the day. So you can see in the chat that everybody's commenting on left or right. Yeah. I love it. That's yeah, and it's often a big split, right? On which one, that's why we have them both up here. Cause it shows up, um, even though we can obviously have like what it is, it can show up a little bit differently, you know, between people. That's fun. Thanks for, uh, Thanks for going with a little levity there with the, the cartoons. It's a fun way to, to visually represent. Erin, let's talk about some of the ways that imposter syndrome is showing up. Let's see. So we've kind of identified these three big buckets, kind of holding back, pushing too hard, and minimizing success. Then we'll dive a little bit deeper into each one. Meg, if you want to do the holding yeah. back. Yep. So sometimes holding back is a physical holding back. So this is a little harder in the Zoom room, the Zoom the Zoom world that we're living in now, but um, thinking about the way people are posturing and positioning themselves around a conference table, for example, um, the, the chair that they might select in a meeting, are they sitting close and leaning forward? Or are they holding back? Are they choosing a seat outside the perimeter? Can be a very physical representation of imposter syndrome, but it can also be, especially for those of us that are in positions of hiring um, and seeking talent, it can be highly, highly qualified individuals not applying for that next role, not putting their hand up in the air, um, not simply filling out the application, but also not even inquiring, not even um, looking at career advancement as part of their overall plan for their, their employment situation. And so as leaders, we have a, an opportunity to start to identify that and help, again, coach and encourage those around us through that process. Um, holding back is, it's physical, right? But it's also that um, it's a, can be the words that we use too. And that's um, limiting language is one of the things that we talk about um, in more depth as we dig deeper into this topic. But thinking about the words that we use that are very, um, well, I'm just checking in. I'm sorry to bother you. I don't mean to waste your time, but um, think about that in your written and, and in your word choice, how often those words are coming up. Meg, I see myself doing it with the word just. Yeah. And so I've worked really hard to remove just. And if I'm late for a meeting, I've said like, thanks for your patience instead of saying, sorry, I'm late. But it's really rewiring your brain to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's an article or two about this stuff, about how women use those words as fillers uh, instead of doing it versus how a man might send a communication. Yeah. 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 It's 
there's a great meme or video that's on Instagram. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it's basically this woman and she's proofing her email that like removes just, it removes like the exclamation point, it removes this and she's like sending it like a man, right? And then it's like afterwards she hits send and then her hand's shaking with this like <laughs> cup of coffee. So we actually just covered limiting language in the mastermind group we did last week. And it's definitely an area that like it hits home with so many people. Um, and it shows up a lot. Yeah. Um, Aaron pushing too hard. And oh, before we do that, um, Drew, yeah. yeah, I feel versus I believe or I know. Uh, yep. Yeah, very powerful language. Um, important to know, though, Aaron and I are not proposing, nor do I think we agree as human beings that we want to completely remove personality and feeling and emotion. That's where connection happens. So this is, this is the kind of thing when you're proofreading the email for the 17th time and you see the word, just like Katie used, great example, I'm sorry it took me so long. If someone hasn't given you a deadline, what are you apologizing for, right? Recognizing like, oh, wait, there it is, and I'm going to take that out doesn't mean we have to start sending cold scripted emails, right? Please, let's not do that. I don't want to work in that, <laughs> in that society. Um, there's a fine line. There's a balance here, but the awareness is, is so important. Um, moving on, Erin, pushing too hard. I was like, this is definitely my bucket, big time. This is where all you perfectionists are going to come into play. Um, so pushing too hard is right. That really that comes up in that fear of failure and fear of making a mistake, right? It all goes back to the being found out, right? And being a fraud. And that's kind of where it is really heavily driven by the perfectionism. So Meg, you already talked about it, right? Reading that email for the 17th time to make sure there's not a a chance of a typo, um, that's the perfectionism that you're showing up. The over preparation goes hand in hand. So you might be leading a big presentation or putting together a proposal and you just prepare, 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 prepare to minimize any chance um, of anything going wrong. Um, in the workplace, right? It's gonna be the people that are working too hard, right? You're gonna have your, those people, right? In your organization that they work and they work and they work and they work and they never stop. And you might be looking at their workload, right? I remember this coming up as a, as a team leader, like, okay, well, like it's in line with other people. And sometimes it's getting to that root cause. It can be tied to this imposter syndrome and perfectionism side of things. The other area it shows up, especially in leaders, I would say too, is not delegating, right? If they're kind of coming from that place of perfectionism and fear of errors, you don't want it to reflect on you. You don't delegate and kind of put that trust in other people. And then not asking for help is a big way it shows up in people in general, regardless of their role with any organization. And just, we kind of wanted to um, end this category with kind of all these things, right? We've been talking a lot, you've heard a lot about it, is like burnout, right? Within organizations. And that's been a topic that's been coming up a lot pre-COVID, but definitely during COVID with all these competing demands and stressors. But this kind of imposter syndrome, perfectionism, overwork um, can definitely lead to the burnout too that people are experiencing. Meg, anything you wanted to add in there? No, nope, but that, man, I, I, perfectionism, and I like to say her like sassy older cousin procrastination are real for me because the two go, the two go hand in hand. And um, we're going to talk in a little bit about mantras, um, but I've been using one a lot lately that's helped me in those moments where I feel paralyzed um, and not able to move forward because I'm so caught in that that perfection trap. So um, we're going to wrap this up with minimizing success. And this is really when you see those high achievers um, who have achieved, right? That's, that's what we do, um, diminishing that success and passing it off to someone else on the team or to luck or timing or just having to, you know, well, it's my job. It's, it's what I'm here to do or blaming it on the software or giving credit to the software. Well, the system makes it easy. Um, there's no I in team is something we're taught as young people, right? Don't take credit. Sometimes we we can and we deserve it and um, and we should. And how can we create environments where we're really recognizing the success of individuals at an individual level to help them if they might be feeling um, this sort of thing? I'm keeping an eye on the time. Aaron and I want to work through the material here, but we also want to leave good time for questions at the end. So we're going to we're going to keep moving. Please keep them coming in the chat. I love how engaged you all are. Thank you for that. Um, and Erin, let's, let's keep moving. 
Yeah. And Nicole, thanks for what you shared um, in the chat, kind of relating the perfectionism into the procrastination. They definitely, as Meg said, can go hand in hand and be related at times too. Um, why does all this matter, right, is with imposter syndrome. Um, we're going to be kind of tackling it today a little bit from organizations and why it matters within your teams and companies. Um, but know this overlaps, right, with if you're experiencing these feelings um, as individuals, um, it's equally important. So feeling of imposter syndrome, right, as Meg talked about, I think, with the hiring, right, they impact the decision both employee employees make in terms of their career, in terms of what projects they choose to go on, in terms of the conversations they might be willing to have within their team. Um, also, prospective hires, do they apply for a job at your company because they don't check off every single job requirement or do they not? Um, and so that really is huge for organizations as they're trying to really build you know, diverse teams and recruit people from different backgrounds is kind of taking that into consideration. Um, it impacts how you show up at work, you know, definitely and how leaders show up for their teams and the relationships that they form with the people that report to them um, as well. And I think one thing that I think is really, I think we live in a very fast changing society, right? And so I think it Imposter syndrome in many ways can stifle innovation within organizations if it's not managed to and um, companies aren't kind of creating those cultures that really w welcome and are very open to the new ideas and to providing feedback and to challenging the status quo, you know, is really just building a culture around that can help people who may be more hesitant due to feelings of imposter syndrome and really kind of um, helping support them and speaking up. Um, specifically within a leadership context, because this is near and dear to my heart, it's going to impact who applies for those leadership roles. So I think kind of as you're building up leadership pipelines within company, is you're going to have your go-getter, right? Maybe your people that could even be a little too confident or overconfident to just raise their hand immediately to take on that project, to take on that role. But don't look past the people that aren't you know, and kind of listening to the, you know, and working with managers who potentially are helping coach up and coming leaders within the organization to, you know, um, become, be more aware, right? So they're kind of looking for potentially those word choices and stuff so they can kind of broaden who's in that pipeline for leadership too. Anything, Meg, how about you? What would you say why it matters? I'm, I'm with you and I think about innovation specifically and and you and I both having roots in the insurance industry and and just how much opportunity there is frankly for innovation in that industry and and every day how many new ideas are popping up but what would happen if if even more people felt that their ideas and their different different opinions were were welcome and then the tie into corporate culture um it's no longer 17 items down on the agenda for the year for most companies, it's number one or two. How do you create teams? How do you create an environment that prospective employees are going to want to work in? And it's becoming more and more important as you know we make those hiring decisions. So it's definitely getting a lot more attention. We'll talk about some of the things very strategically that we can do as organizations to to facilitate a culture that is open to conversations like this in a minute, but it's it's definitely more relevant now, I think, um, than ever. So this is, if if you're seeing parallels, like feel free to throw them in the chat, either in your organization or in your opinion, um, where you see there being blocks or opportunities, um, feel free to share those with us, with us there. So with kind of kind of coming all to bringing it all together the what can we do right we now know what imposter syndrome is like why it matters how it shows up um, but what can you do kind of within your roles as hr leaders in your organization um the, so we once again have the three buckets awareness action and accountability um so with awareness is i think a big thing right is the observing and listening i think right you're going to now that you kind of know how it shows up you'll be surprised sometimes as you increase your awareness on imposter syndrome is how 
readily you're able to pick it out and potentially other people that you're working with or people you're interviewing, you know, and being able to kind of um, help people, especially the people you're working with, reframe their beliefs. I'll tell a quick story. It's more of a personal nature, not in um, professional setting, but I have a really, one of my best friends started a podcast um, based with February, March of last year. And over the summer, we're at a co-working space. We're doing some work on some stuff. And she's telling me like, oh, my Instagram and the podcast um, signups have kind of been blowing up, right? She's like, it's amazing. She was like, and I was like, that's fantastic. And she's just like, yeah, but you know, it's timing, it's nostalgia, it's luck. This is what people are looking for right now, right? Because people are all home and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, time out, time out. This is you. Like, I see what you're doing. I'm working right alongside of you and everything that you're doing. And I think kind of having that awareness, right? And doing the work that I do with here with Meg was able me, enable me to kind of recognize it. And then kind of re help reframe it for people. So then she was like, you know what, you're right. She's like, I have been busting my butt to do this. And so it kind of helped with that. So I think that's really powerful for leaders and HR leaders um, to do in their conversations with people as well. Um, just a, similar with the awareness, it's just recognizing imposter syndrome can impact everyone. I think this is an area that sometimes gets equated to women on only women, um, but just know it can impact men and women, but it also impacts people differently, kind of based on their experiences and what they have, um, kind of what they're showing up with from their own background. Um, and then just having the awareness of understanding how imposter syndrome can kind of fit in with the context and the culture within your organization, um, especially in certain systems that could be in place that could be making the problem worse, right? I came from um, as much as I love my last organization on some level, it, it could be a good old boys club, right? And you're like the only woman at like a client meeting or you only, you know, I work with contractors and real estate developers, very male dominated industry. Uh, and so it just kind of recognizing that these different factors can come into play um, and just being a little more aware of those. And action, Meg, I'm gonna turn that one over to you with the, yeah, this no, I, I relate um, everything you just, just shared. It's, it's been fascinating to do this work and sit in this chair, having these conversations and hear the stories um, of how it's manifesting for individuals. It's, it's different across the board, but definitely some, some commonalities. So action. So one of the most powerful things, and Erin and I just witnessed this, we uh, co-facilitate a six-week mastermind where we go super deep into this topic at a much different level one of the participants shared in the group that she had been on, in a one-on-one -on -one with her manager and she'd been expressing some of the feelings that she was having. And her manager said, oh, that's imposter syndrome. I have that too. And the connection that it created and the trust that was created between that manager and um, the woman that's part of our program, frankly, it was, it was one of those moments where I got chills when she told the story. I think Erin would agree. And saying it out loud is a really powerful really powerful, simple, basic. And whether you're saying it out loud as the person that's feeling it, or you're holding space as a leader for, for someone else to say it out loud can be really powerful. So fundamentally just saying the words and acknowledging. Um, another thing we can do in our organizations and our conversations is give credit and recognition and feedback in real time when it's due. So if someone did a really great job on a presentation, take the 30 seconds, even if it's uh, not at the most opportune time, or don't let that be the last thing on your priority list, right? Bump it up to the top because that feedback can often be the piece of information that helps the recipient keep going in their journey and starts to build um, their own confidence in navigating this really, really tricky and layered and nuanced topic. So another thing we see a lot is overwork. And we're seeing it in this environment in particular, where I was just writing out the, the phrase work-life balance. And instead of saying work-life balance, I said work-life baloney, because it's what well, that's what it is right now. Like, what, what is this? Our living room is our office and our kids are in our like, and it's lovely, right? For all the reasons we shared when we got started, but it's, it's just not practical, practical. It's not attainable. And so as leaders, we have to lead by example but now more than ever, right? So when you see the email come in at nine o'clock at night, don't respond to it. Don't send one yourself. 
don't, or even have the courage to call out your teammate or your employee or the person who sent it and say, I love you. I see you. I thank you for the information, but I also want you to honor yourself and what you need. And I think we're seeing a shift. We're seeing more of an em embracing of this in our organizations, but that leading by example is really important because little eyes are watching, right? And those little eyes don't always belong in children and they don't always belong in, in, you know, young, young people, right? It's us looking Looking at our peers and looking at our leaders to set an example too. And the last thing is resources. If this is a topic that you as a leader, as your organization believes is impacting your corporate culture, offer the books, have the book club, have the course, have the materials available to your team. There are resources, right? It doesn't have to be a thing. Um, and it, it will always be a thing. We believe that to some degree, but it can start to be just as, as much as you're leaning into making sure that people are having ethics training and they're having, you know, making sure that the business agenda is met, starting to think about whole people um, as whole people is really powerful too. Erin, accountability, our favorite. <laughs> no, and I love everything you shared with the action piece. I think there's so much power in just starting the conversation, like the story you share with the individual in our mastermind group and really just building those relationships, right? Where there's space for the vulnerability and honesty, you know, because I think that's incredibly impactful. Um, and even the best really, I had a great relationship with my boss, but I never million years would have been like, you know, I'm having these feelings, right? But I think when a manager opens the door, it can just be really changing in that relationship. But to your point, accountability, one thing we've found personally, so Meg and I are imposter syndrome accountability buddies. So we will pick up the phone and say, I'm having a moment. I need some support. Talk it through. The same thing can work in your organizations. Um, and it doesn't even have to be called like, you know, imposter syndrome or accountability buddy, right? But if you're having people that you're working on career pathing with or that you think might be experiencing some of these feelings during times of transition is offering kind of those accountability buddies or peer support or peer groups is just kind of that space where they can really navigate um, that those feelings, but also hold each other accountable, right? You know, say like, this is what my goal is and what I'm working toward. And then they have have that person that they can kind of go to and that who's also willing to hold them accountable. Um, from a manager standpoint, and I think this comes with companies as a whole, is setting healthy expectations, um, both for themselves, you know, and kind of what they can expect for themselves as leaders, but also kind of within their teams as well, as we kind of talked about with that perfectionism and the overwork and the, the it kind of holding ourselves as leaders accountable for kind of how we respond right to success to failure to recognition to feedback to all those different things um, that can be contributing factors to imposter syndrome and then well, kind of the last thing is we've talked a lot about or mentioned it several times culture right and i know katie i know this is an area you and i've talked about in the past and i know it's very um something that's really near and dear in the hr world right trying to create cultures that are you know supporting um, their employees. Um, it's just if there are those instances, one thing we've noticed if you have cultures or even individuals that are very toxic or bullying that can really cause lasting damage on organization, but on individuals within that organization, because we've often said like an employee's experience as great as HR might be and the executive team might be their experience day to day is really driven by their manager and the teams that they're on, you know, and so really keeping a close eye on that because that can um, we talk about in the mastermind imposter syndrome can be driven by from childhood and your whole life, but it also can be driven by a specific person, a specific experience that causes you to come to doubt kind of everything you've achieved and accomplished um, in your career to date. So I think that's so incredibly important to just not let that behavior continue and perpetuate within organization. So. I'll get off my soapbox on that one, but oh, I love and I'm having going. been through a toxic manager situation. That point is um, particularly important to me. It comes from a real place. It, it comes from real experience. And you mentioned um, anyone who's done any reading or research or heard about imposter syndrome before, the inner critic is what we call that 
feeling, that manifestation, that person in some cases, that really is the underpinning that's really fueling these thoughts and, and behaviors in us. And it can be a combination of all of those things or, or a very specific moment where you started to feel, feel the feeling, so to speak. I want to, I want to drop this thought as I'm sitting here, frankly, listening to Erin sharing her experience. There's a lot of, um, a lot of talk in corporate environments, right, about creating mentorship opportunities where you pair a more seasoned um, employee or someone that's got, you know, a little more, more time in the, or tenure with a younger employee. And, and I see great value in that mentorship both ways, right? When it comes to this particular topic, what we very often need in the moment in terms of accountability is someone that is on the journey with us, which I know is why Aaron and I resonate so closely as we're having these accountability check-ins. Because when you're feeling these feelings, which are intensely personal, often you don't want to hear the, well, just get over it or fake it till you make it. Or you're, you're making a mountain out of a molehill or throw the cliche or the metaphor out there. What you need is, is some support and recognition that your feelings are valid. And then perhaps a little action item to help you move through it. And so this can be a great opportunity if you're thinking about ways to engage teams and create more of that peer to peer support. Um, this can be a great topic to connect people together um, on that level. Of course, they have to be interested and willing participants, but it is something that frankly, I just, it just kind of dawned on me, Erin, as you were, as you were sharing. Um, so we're going to bring it all kind of around now, and we're going to talk through some of the things that um, we want you to leave with after sort of learning about this topic today as you take it back into your day and into your workplace. Um, we have 10 minutes left to just a little self check so that we have time for questions. Um, we have five minutes left. So Erin, let's zip right through this. Um, beginning a dialogue, right? We said it. Saying it out loud is a really powerful first step. Um, it is something that absolutely can be talked about. There is research, there are resources are, to support the discussion. It can be really powerful simply to begin, um, to begin a dialogue. And also it sends a great message about who we are as leaders and the kind of companies that we are building to really demonstrate this sort of connected leadership. You are connected to your own thoughts and feelings, but also connected to your teams. And that's really powerful and inviting. Um, for those in the in the workplace. And Erin, I'll have you take the last two. Yep, and the, not the whole picture, right? That's what we've kind of talked about. It's kind of the intersection of obviously the individual, but it's also the culture and the organizations they are, you know, showing up within. Um, so it's not, as we said, it's not about fixing a person. It's about the awareness. It's about the recognition and then providing the tools, support, and building the cultures that really minimize the impacts of imposter syndrome. And one we love to highlight is that it's not all bad. Sometimes, you know, imposter syndrome gets a bad rap, like, oh, who would want imposter syndrome, right? However, like these individuals, right, if you have imposter syndrome, you're typically very driven. You're willing to push yourself outside your comfort zone. The people aren't feeling feelings of imposter syndrome if they're kind of staying in their little box and not doing that. Um, they tend to be much more humble, right? And I think as leaders, do we want that overconfident leader who doesn't share a single emotion and is kind of always that? Or do we want those more the leaders, right, that are more humble and willing to be vulnerable? Um, and as we mentioned, imposter syndrome and success seem to go hand in hand. So individuals um, that are experiencing imposter syndrome likely going to be some of your most successful people, you know, and, and kind of what they achieve and what they're willing to work for. Um, but then also just fostering that open dialogue can be incredibly powerful um, for kind of both parties, both individuals up and coming in the organization and the more senior leaders within your organization as well. I love it. We have reached the end. We, we have want reached the end. Erin um, and I have shared our email addresses. Um, we're very active on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with us there. We'd love to stay in conversation with you about this topic or anything else that's near and dear to your heart. Um, Katie, with that, do we want to open it up for some questions, feedback, resonation? Absolutely. Anybody have any questions?
don't be shy. The hardest <laughs> part as a facilitator is the waiting. It's the waiting. Is someone going to say something? Are they, are they just trying you get to get under them? Right. Talk about in the moment. Um, are they trying to find the mute button? Um, great presentation. Thank you. Yeah. There's so much support. Definitely. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for the great feedback and the questions. Um, yeah. And as Meg said, we're happy to kind of continue the conversation and, you know, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or that is something that we're super passionate about. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, Drew, thanks for that comment. Um, lately gotten a little emotional. I hear ya. And as we figure all this out, right, this hybrid work environment and what's coming next, one of the things that I've declared an act of self-care is turning off my camera. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I have messy hair and I don't want to change my shirt. Sometimes it means I'm just feeling the feelings and I just need a minute. And I appreciate Drew, you sharing that. Um, this is the, this is life, right? This is the important stuff. So thank you. Thanks again, Aaron, any closing thoughts from you before we hand it back over? No, I think you covered it. I and mean, we really genuinely appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys this morning, share this topic. Um, so thank you, um, Katie and all of everyone at, um, Northwest HR Council. So thank you. Yeah, we just appreciate it. This is such a big topic. I feel like the last week, now that we're hitting the one year mark of being home with COVID, I swear there's been handfuls of people just saying like mentally exhausted or just tired or it's just crazy. I think we're all in this together. And like Drew said, there's a community out there. There's resources available please connect with Aaron and Meg. They have great posts that they're putting out every few to couple of days. Um, they even have some great articles on their sites of different things that you guys can pick up on with books, um, some blogs. So I would highly recommend if you get a chance, reach out to them. Uh, again, thank you ladies for your time. It's greatly appreciated. And if there's anything that NHRC can do for you, please let us know, but thank, thank you. you. And with that, guys, we're ending our, our roundtable. Thank you for attending today. It's greatly appreciated.